I've been asked to speak and, and my topic that I've chosen is why water changes are crucial and testing alone is not enough. Um, one of the things that I see in the hobby, a lot of changes over time. I started Kent Marine 30 years ago and so I've been doing this probably as long as almost anyone in the industry and um, a lot of changes have happened um, and there's a lot of information out there that may be good but it's not applicable to you or your situation and there's other information that is solely for the purpose of selling you something and um, I like for us to think about what we're doing. We're keeping live animals, many of them we're taking out of the wild and we, they deserve the best life that we can give them and it's my opinion that water changes is one of the real ways that we can keep our aquarium in good condition and it will cure a multitude of ills, many of which even the old heads in here can't describe to you. Um, as I've been introduced, um, my name is Jack Kent. I started aquarium keeping at seven years old. Um, I had my first disaster when my sister, who was younger than me, had a birthday party before I got home from school and they decided to feed peppermint candy to my guppies. And I came home and most of them were floating in the aquarium. So, you know, when we start out in keeping fish, whatever kind, you know, we, we have disasters, but hopefully we learn from those disasters. And nowadays with the internet and the YouTube channels and things of that nature, we should be able to learn from the disasters of others before we have to take all of our animals through that, uh, through that horror. I still wonder at the ocean. It's a beautiful place to me. I, I can't believe the diversity of creatures that we have and the things that are available to us in the hobby. A little more background on myself, uh, as was mentioned earlier, I started Kent Marine in 1989. I sold that in 2004, and I was out of the industry for about five years because I had a non-compete agreement, and then in 2012, I started Continuum, and a couple of years later, uh, we merged with Brightwell, and then about two years ago, Kay and I bought that company out, so we're the sole owners of Brightwell and Continuum. I really didn't set out to have two different companies, but that's the way it ended up. Um, a couple of interesting thoughts. I believe that the hardest aquarium to keep is a freshwater planted aquarium, a beautiful planted aquarium for freshwater. Um, I know very few people that are able to successfully do that and keep their plants looking healthy, and there are a number of reasons for that. And if we were in a different setting, we could talk about those. As you probably know, in Brightwell and Continuum, we make freshwater products, we make products for ponds, and we make products for marine and reef aquariums. Um, old friend of mine, Phil Shane, who used to own Quality Marine in California, made this statement once. He was probably at least one of the first importers of live tropical marine fish into America back in the day. He said, people keep corals because they can't keep fish alive. <laughs> and I agree with that in a large part because fish are more difficult than corals. Corals are not that difficult if you follow the, the standard procedures that have been set up by people that have gone before you, you should be able to be successful. And um, there are a number of prescriptions available for you for those. I am a professional engineer, I'm a degreed engineer, I've spent a lot of my career before I started Kent Marine, uh, 20 years in heavy industry doing um, computer process control of chemical processes and mechanical processes. So I wanted to start things off with a little joke because I think we ought to have fun today. So Mr. Jones peered over his back fence and he saw little Johnny digging a hole. And he says, Johnny, why are you digging that hole? He said, well, my goldfish died. And he says, that's an awful large hole for a goldfish, Johnny. He said, well, he's inside your cat. <laughs> so I have several goals today of my talk. I want to be provocative a little bit. I want you to think about the things that you're told to do. Uh, because after all, you're in charge of your own aquarium and you have to run it to the best of your ability. So we have a lot of information that's given out in the hobby and a lot of it is given out as scientific fact when in fact it may not. And so I just want you to keep in mind as we talk, um, religion is fine in its own setting, but if faith is required for you to do the things that you do, then that no longer science. Okay, so um, we have a lot of high-tech equipment, a lot of high-tech chemicals out there, and I encourage you to ask manufacturers why they do what they do. Um, 
I think that at Brightwell, we can tell you why we do what we do, and that's why I want you to ask those questions. I think there are a lot of people out there that can't support what they're doing. So we have several challenges in the hobby today that I wanted to point out. Uh, one that not a lot of hobbyists are aware of, we have a lot of government intervention that's happening in the hobby uh, on the importation of animals, particularly keeping corals. There are a lot of, well, there are several law firms who make their whole living off of some little known EPA regulations and they are trying to stop the importation of many of the corals that we keep. I feel like that we're on the verge with the animals that we're raising. If you look in this auditorium, you'll see some tank raised large angels. You'll, you'll see some smaller tank raised angels and some other tank raised fish. We need to have the time to be able to get these animals propagated and start having a sustainable hobby in the, in the world that we live in today. So I encourage you to become involved in those things. There's an organization by the name of PJAC in the aquarium industry that defends us a lot. As you know, a lot of the fishery in Hawaii is being closed down. And so if we don't do things in a responsible manner, you know, let's say we have a fish and we decide to dump it in the ocean, that's not a good thing to do, you know, if it's a non-native species. So we need to be responsible for what we're doing and we need to be involved politically and, and stay abreast of what's happening out there. Also, there are a lot of new and prolific diseases in the, in the hobby today that were not present when I started years ago. And, um, you know, many of you have encountered those the hard way. Um, there are a lot of coral diseases that are bacterial in nature and there are a lot of parasites that are out there, flatworms and nudibranchs and, and, and red bugs and things of that nature that, that we didn't have a number of years ago. And I think that some of those, some of the propagation of these diseases are due to mishandling in our wholesale operations and things of that nature. It's, it's, I'm a real believer in when you bring a lot of animals through something, you need to take that system down and do what I call nuke it every, every so often, fill it with Clorox, kill everything, and then start over. But a lot of that's not being done. And if you're not careful, you can end up with a great disaster in your aquarium. I'm, I'm thinking of a good friend of mine who owns a, a large store in Georgia and it's probably the best store in Georgia, and he's a great hobbyist, mm -hmm. but a friend of his brought a little frag that he had bought at a show not like, unlike this, and gave it to him uh, one evening on a Friday evening, and he was um, you know, tired from the day and so forth, so he just dropped it in his 300 gallon reef in the front of the aquarium, and so he ended up with an outbreak of flatworms, mm -hmm. and he had Acropora that had been living there for years, and he had to basically jackhammer his reef and take it apart, and go through a lot. So, you know, pay attention to those kinds of things that you do. I'm a big believer in quarantining and we'll talk about that as we go through. So I have a couple of shameless plugs I just wanted to throw at you and invite you to come by the Brightwell stand. Um, we have some new products out, Coral Recover, which is one of the items that you see up here. It's the second one from me. Um, is a real breakthrough type product because it will stop a lot of the diseases that you have in corals, the diseases that we commonly call, call by their symptoms, black band disease, white band disease, white paste. These are things that we see in the corals and we don't always know the bacteria that are involved and that cause this, but um, this is a natural product. It's different than other things on the market and it will stop the progression of most bacterial disease without damaging your biological filter, which is important. You can always use an antibiotic and there's some very strong antibiotics that are out there. The problem is usually you'll also nuke your biological filter, you get ammonia spikes and you have a lot of other problems. In our continuing line we have our new coral color intense products uh, come by and take a look at them and and talk to us about them if you have time um, I know Mike's talk is on coral color this afternoon I'm gonna st uh, stay for that and um, hear what he has to say but there's a lot of, of uh, advancement in that area so as we talk today you know there are many different kinds of, of marine aquariums that people use and you know, you see fish only tanks, you see fish only with live rock, but for our talk today, if I don't mention what we're talking about, I'm, I'm referring to reefs. So that's um, aquariums that have live corals, probably some live rock and fish usually. There are many rules of, of keeping a reef aquarium, um, but I set up a few because I wanted to just talk about some of the things that I consider to be very, very important and things that people miss sometimes. Um, I'm a great believer in acronyms, I like them, we use them in the hobby, you see MACNA, you see RAP for Reefapalooza, one of my favorites is SLS, which means slippery little sucker, 
And um, we use terms like GH and KH. Most people don't understand those terms fully. Um, by the way, does anybody want to know what GH means? Okay, that's what we think it means, but it's, it's a German term, it's Gesamtherte, which basically means the same thing, and it, 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 it's hard like a table. So it, it literally means total hardness uh, from all ions. And uh, KH is German as well, Carbonathärte, uh, similar type word. Uh, we, there's a term we'll use today called NSW, which means natural seawater. And we'll talk about that in relation to artificial seawater. And then uh, ULNS, you'll hear ultra no, low nutrient system. And I coined one for today, uh, WYDDIS, which basically means whatever you do, do it slowly. So that's really my, my first uh, rule of reef keeping. If you're in a hurry, you need a different hobby. Um, everything happens in a marine tank slowly, and if it doesn't happen slowly, it's usually bad. And um, you know, I don't want you to change your water chemistry rapidly. Uh, you certainly don't want to change your temperature rapidly. You, you don't want to change salts without thinking about what you're doing. Uh, there are a lot of ramifications for making changes. The animals that we keep are very hardy. As I mentioned earlier, uh, corals are thought to be less hardy than they really are. I mean, if you think about it in Australia, for instance, I mean, they'll tell you a coral can't survive out of the water. Well, in the Great Barrier Reef, they come up, feed out of the water in noonday sun for hours and hours and hours. So. Uh, these animals are, are made for the environments that they're in. They are hardy and they can survive. They can survive in our aquariums. What they don't do well with is change. And so with the um, advent of a lot of advice now to micromanage and tweak every nutrient in our aquariums, uh, we find people changing things too much. And many times they change them too rapidly. So think about it a little bit, slow down you know, as you're making changes. Um, sometimes we get excited, you know, for the same reason that we drop that brand new frag in our aquarium without quarantining it first and seeing if there's a problem, is because we're excited, it's our hobby. We, we, we want to see that beautiful little frag sitting in a place. We want to see it grow up from there. And, um, you know, we just need to realize that there are ramifications for the things that we do that sometimes are negative. So you may notice that I wrote number two and three twice and I did that on purpose because I believe alkalinity is probably, if I could only measure one thing in my aquarium, if I had no other test kits, I would measure the alkalinity. I think it's extremely important. I think alkalinity and pH are two quantities that people don't fully understand. I think they have a little bit of an inkling for what they do and how they relate with each other, but we see a lot of people having problems. They add what I call a pH adjuster. They think they're adjusting the alkalinity and they're not and so they have problems. Um, as we talk about the difference between an artificial aquarium environment and the ocean, and there are some differences and there need to be, there need to be differences, uh, we'll talk a little bit about why our alkalinity needs to be different in an aquarium than the ocean and what that does for us. Temperature is certainly important as well, and as I mentioned earlier, the Great Barrier Reef is 85 to 89 degrees, which is much hotter than we normally keep a marine aquarium ourselves. I like 79 degrees most of the time, but I do encourage you to check the animals and where they come from that you're keeping because you may have, need to have a different temperature than that. And then, of course, there are a lot of people nowadays that are keeping things like temperate reef tanks that where animals come from places like Washington and Oregon and you know they're, they're used to cold water, they used to employ chillers and they keep it much cooler than that. Um, quarantine, or did I say quarantine? I've mentioned that earlier already. I think with fish or with corals, it's one of the best things that you can do nowadays. I mean, we're taking animals from the ocean, we stress them out, then we take them to a, multiple wholesalers, whether it's in the Philippines, then it takes a nasty plane flight to Los Angeles. It you know, sits there for some period of time on the tarmac. They, they finally bring it into the holding facility. They put it in a system that has flatworms in it, you know, the coral is going to get infected. And so when you get it, it's going to have flatworms on it. It didn't have them when it left the ocean. And uh, you can't control that whole supply chain. And um, because of that, I think you just really need to pay attention. Um, I've already touched on this for coral stability, I think is the most important thing we can do for them. There's nothing wrong with making changes in the aquarium. Just do it slowly. Do it slower many times than you're told to or that you might want to do. 
So we talked about alkalinity a little bit. I want to discuss it a little bit further. It's going to, it's going to play right into what we're talking about with salt. But um, I wrote down some statements. Um, and I want to know, are these statements true or false? So it is the capacity of water to resist changes in pH that would make the water uh, more acidic. So it determines pH. It is measured in degrees KH, milliequivalents per liter, and parts per million calcium carbonate, and is called temporary hardness. In seawater, important ions that determine alkalinity are carbonates, borates, hydroxides, phosphates, and silicates. And when it's low, it'll kill your aquarium faster than jackrabbit. So any thoughts there? Anybody got an idea as, as if, if any of those or all those statements are true? Yeah, they're all true. And um, you know, guys that have been doing this for a while will know that, and people that understand alkalinity will know that. But um, alkalinity is the ability, that's why you call it buffering capacity, just like you have a buffer zone or a buffer on a computer. A buffer is something that allows some give and take between data flow coming one direction and going out another direction in electronics. And then, uh, you know, in a street, it's the buffer zone is the zone in the middle where nobody's supposed to be driving. Um, it is that quality that allows changes to occur without having disaster. And that's exactly what alkalinity does in your aquarium because you can have, at any given alkalinity, you can have a different pH. Or at any given pH, you can have a different alkalinity. But the alkalinity can be thought of as strength of pH. So at a given pH, so let's say your pH is 8.3, if you have an alkalinity that's seven and a half dKH, that pH is less stable than it is at eight. It's much less stable than it is at 10. So nowadays we have a great group of people in the hobby that like to keep very low alkalinities. Some people even approaching seven, which is about what the ocean is, depending on where you measure it. Um, we make our salt at seven and a half because that's what the industry demands of us. It's too low for me. I like eight, even eight and a half. And I don't subscribe to the philosophy that uh, acropores are damaged at lower or at higher alkalinities. Now, if you get on up to 10 or so forth, now we're in a different ball game. But, you know, I think eight and a half or eight is a really good alkalinity for a reef tank. Um, you know, you, as you get closer to seven, you're living dangerously because what can happen is pH can plummet. So if you get some acid added to the system in any manner, and there are a number of ways that that can happen through a malfunctioning calcium reactor to a fish dying behind the rocks that you didn't see and organic acids are produced in the system can cause the pH to come down. And of course, you get the natural carbon dioxide in an aquarium anyway, which tends to make the aquarium lower pH at night than it is in the daytime. So alkalinity is also called temporary hardness. And that's not a term that we use in the aquarium industry very much, but you hear that in the water industry. So if you go down and talk to people that build reverse osmosis filters or uh, do wastewater treatment or do public water supplies, you'll hear the term temporary hardness. And I think it's good for you to hear that term because temporary hardness tells you that your alkalinity is fleeting. Okay, it's going to have to be replaced in some manner. Now, some people replace it with calcium reactors. I think that's a poor way to do it. I like to add a buffer to the aquarium. And of course, when I bring up the term buffers, you know, nowadays it's very vogue for people to say, go down and buy calcium carbonate and use that for a buffer. Well, calcium carbonate's a poor buffer, okay? It will work to an extent, but you really need multiple chemicals in a buffer that interact with each other that stabilize the pH. A good buffer will actually bring pH down as well as it will bring it up. So it provides that give and take that you need in the aquarium to keep your pH at a level that the fish will do well. You start getting much below eight on pH, you're gonna have animals dying. So we've talked about a lot of this already. pH is a measure of how acid or alkaline a system is. Um, if you think about, let's talk about vehicles for instance. So if, if I had a car and a truck, and if they're both traveling at 70 miles an hour, they're both going the same speed, so we might call that pH. 
but the alkalinity of those vehicles is the payload of them. So how much brakes is it going to take to stop that car at 70 miles an hour versus an 18-wheeler with 40,000 pounds of load in the back? So that's where your alkalinity is different than your pH. The pH is the measure of where you are, but the alkalinity is the strength of that or how powerful you are you know, at that speed. So to keep your pH solid, you need to keep your alkalinity up. Okay, we mentioned that phosphates and silicates in the ocean are a major component of alkalinity. If we do that in a marine aquarium, what happens? Anybody? <laughs> algae outbreak, hair algae, cyanobacteria, red stuff growing everywhere, all sorts of problems, dye times on the glass, cleaning the glass every day. So you can call them fertilizers. So you know, if you fertilize your algae, just like if you fertilize your yard, it's gonna grow. So um, to make a good buffer, we make it primarily out of carbonates and borates because they don't cause those kinds of problems in our aquarium. So good buffers are made from carbonates and borates. Um, Sodium bicarbonate, baking soda, is, is not a good buffer in a marine aquarium, although it's a good buffer, it's great in a freshwater aquarium. But if you use it in a marine aquarium, you end up with a pH of 7.8, which is not a good thing. And then I read an article not too long ago about talking about buffering with cockwasser. Do people know what cockwasser is, calcium hydroxide? Okay, it's, it's the old German method of adding calcium to a reef. It's kind of my favorite method, actually, but it's a pain because it's a lot of work, so people have gone to easier systems now. I, I still think you can get better results with cockwasser, so if you're ever adventurous and you want to look at that, that's a good thing to do. But um, calcium hydroxide has a natural pH of about 12, so you try to buffer your system with it. If you want a pH of 12, then it'll do a good job, you know? So, uh, you know, it's, it's not what you want to use. So I wrote a couple of, well, first of all, the second law of thermodynamics, this is, this is a law of science, which is a law of conservation of matter, which basically says that any closed system, uh, any natural process progresses in the direction of increasing disorder. So why is it that we get older and never younger? Why is it when your son cleans his room, it's a miracle, <laughs> but it's gonna get dirty again and it gets worse? And it gets worse over time. So aquariums always get dirtier. They don't get clean up themselves. Detritus builds up, algae grows where you don't want it. Uh, water turns yellow and starts to smell. Uh, desirable chemicals deplete and undesirable nutrients increase. So these are processes that are going on in our aquariums all the time. And so I just kind of wrote the second law of aquarium keeping, which basically says the same thing. Your aquarium's going to get dirtier. And so as it gets dirtier, it's going to cause your animals to have problems. And as they get stressed out, they're going to be more susceptible to disease. They're not going to reproduce. You're going to have all sorts of problems. So, you know, keeping a clean aquarium is, is very, very important. And it's, it's, it's my philosophy that water changes plays, plays a, a huge role in doing that. So why would you not want to do water changes? So is there anybody in here that doesn't do water changes? I think Mike doesn't. Do you, Mike? No, is Mike in here? I'm a big water changer. Oh, you like water change. Okay, so he likes water changes. Okay, so someone had told me that about you. So, so you see they're saying ugly things about you behind your back, right? <laughs> so, uh, um, but, but there, is, there is a philosophy, and we'll get into that when we talk about ICP testing in a few minutes, that says we don't do water changes anymore. And I just think that that's um, it's certainly unwise. And um, water changes is a way to get us back uh, to where we need to be. So I wrote down some ideas about why people wouldn't want to change water. I thought I would have people in the audience that subscribe to this philosophy. It doesn't seem like we do, but you know, the cost, the cost of the salt. And then uh, people don't like the mess of, of changing water. And then we've got gurus out there telling people that you don't have to do water changes anymore. You just test things and you know what they are and you, you fix them, right? That sounds great on the surface. So why would you want to do water changes? Anybody got an idea? Okay. Anything else? Okay, a nutrient export. Serves as an export to any serves as an export to any bad chemicals. Right, right. Yeah, that's kind of like what he said. Okay, so I wrote down some some thoughts. Uh, one, you want to bring all parameters back to seawater level. Now, I won't kid you that if you have a large aquarium, this isn't going to be all you need to do, okay? You'll need to do some other things. If you have a nano tank, I think it's probably reasonable to just do water changes and nothing else. If you use a good salt, 
and all the, the, the chemicals are at seawater level, you probably, that's probably your cheapest alternative for a nanotank, you know, something that's five gallons or less. But as you start getting larger, that be becomes an expensive proposition and a lot of work. And then also when you do large water changes, you do run some risk of changing things too fast and hurting your animals, so you do have to be careful with that. And then uh, I wrote down resolve ionic imbalance from supplementation. You know, um, when two-part calcium and buffer products came out a number of years ago, um, that was the whole philosophy. You know, back in the old days, and we still make those products, um, and they still work, and there's really nothing wrong with them, but, but we use a lot of calcium chloride and strontium chloride. And so even though there's a lot of chlorides in seawater, chloride tends to build up. And so in ratio, chloride to sulfate, if you look at natural seawater versus an aquarium, that eventually that, that number will get off. And although I've probably never seen any negative problems due to that, um, ionic imbalance is thought to be an undesirable condition. And then um, we want to add back majors, minors, and trace elements, which is kind of what we were talking about a while ago. Uh, we want to reduce pollutants, which you mentioned, you know, phosphorus, nitrogen, uh, maybe heavy metals that build up in the system. You know, as you, when you feed an aquarium food, let's say, you know, you're putting things in there that you may not know you're putting in there. Like one of the things that we find is brine shrimp is like one of the worst offenders. And a lot of frozen food has brine shrimp in it and they don't even tell you or they may have it in a small print on the, bo on the package and you don't know it. But uh, brine shrimp's raised in ponds and it's raised with 888 fertilizer. And brine shrimp are great carriers of what they're fed. And um, I've never measured brine shrimp myself where you could even get a measurement on the test. I mean, it's always black and it should be blue, some shade of dark blue on a phosphate test kit. So, you know, you wanna be aware of that. And then I wrote this one kind of tongue in cheek. I like to, to joke a little bit, does your house ever get stuffy? So if your house gets stuffy, um, what do you do? You open a door, open a window, you get some fresh air in the house. And that's really what you're doing with a water change in some ways. So the buildup of organics in an aquarium is due to feeding the fish, it's due to fish excrement in the water, it's due to uh, coral excrement in the water, um, and maybe some of the additives that you're adding that don't get used up. And so you have a couple of major categories of organic chemicals that build up in the water, and water changes helps you get this out. And one is called POM, particulate organic material. Uh, this is stuff that you might see as floating particles in the water, and it becomes detritus on the bottom of the aquarium, and it just accumulates in places and becomes mulm, and it's unsightly. Um, it also can carry some things that you don't want in the water. Um, sometimes that you have phosphates in there that can uh, redissolve over time back into the tank and raise your phosphate level. It's good to get that stuff out. Um, a good thing to do with that is a, a particular filter, like a bag filter of some uh, micron filter that's basically rated a certain number of microns. And uh, depending on what kind of aquarium you keep, you'll have to adjust the size of that. Some of that material is extremely tiny though. And then you have dissolved organic material. And this is the stuff that's really hard to get out. So you have carbohydrates, you got humic substances. These are things like you'd see as leaf mold in the forest, they turn your water tea colored. Amino acids, sugars, lipids. Um, and then you have toxins. I wanna talk a little bit about that today too. You know, uh, if you're keeping corals, they're always at war. So if you lived on a rock and you couldn't move, if you didn't protect your, your space, something else is gonna move in on you. And so they have protection mechanisms that are designed into them so they can sting their neighbors, they can re release toxins into the water. Even some of the algae does this. Well, in the ocean, it's not much of a problem, but in the confines of a small marine aquarium, you can have problems from those. And they build up in the water. And some of them you can take out by protein skimming, some of them you can't. Um, Many of the toxins that are in a marine tank are proteinaceous, but many of them are not. I, I corned an, a, another little acronym for you called USERBA, which means you can't remove by adding. Reef Aquarium Chemistry for Beginners, part four, uh, what chemicals may detrimentally accumulate. The most general methods for reducing organics include skimming and using granular activated carbon. Both of these tend to bind completely or partially hydrophobic organics. That means organics that don't like water. 
um, but may not effectively remove hydrophilic organics. Those are the organics that are really dissolved in the water. And that's one of the reasons I use all three methods. So he's saying he uses water changes and carbon and protein skimming. So, um, you know, definitely, I mean, here's a, an expert that subscribes to water changes. So let's talk a little bit about the kinds of filtration. We mentioned a couple of them. You know, you typically want to have uh, particulate filtration. Um, you'll need uh, chemical filtration, which is typically carbon and resins. Um, I will tell you most of the resins in the industry don't really work well. Um, so be careful when you buy them. They're very, very hyped up. They don't do much. Um, we see a lot of that. Many of them are wrong resins. They selected the wrong types of resins. Uh, I think you're better off with carbon unless you know who you're buying it from or, or whatever. So we go to great lengths on our resins to make sure they work. Um, I said chemical slash biological on protein skimmers, although you hear that under chemical more than biological, but one of the big functions of a skimmer that you don't see a lot about is in the bacterial processes that go on in an aquarium. So one of the great areas or ways that you can export phosphates from the water and to a second degree nitrates is bacteria will consume phosphates and when they die, you want to get them out of the water. And one of the ways you get bacteria out of the water column is through skimming. They come out in the skimmate as part of the nasty stuff that you see that come out. And that can be a major way of removing phosphate from your aquarium. So I think it's important. And of course, biological, um, there's a lot of move toward aquariums that don't have enough biological filtration in them nowadays, and it saddens me because I know people are gonna get in trouble. Um, for instance, we make a lot of live rock, artificial live rock out of concrete, has no porosity whatsoever. So one of the things that revolutionized this whole hobby, a guy by the name of George Smith, I think late 60s, early 70s, produced an article in FAMA, which is Freshwater Marine Aquarium ma Magazine. You old heads will remember it. It's long gone, it's not out there anymore. But he adapted a wastewater filter to use in marine aquariums. And that's one of the major reasons why we got where we are today. Um, it had bio balls in it. Uh, you were sprinkling water over the bio balls. It was mostly an aerobic process, meaning adding oxygen. So you were converting ammonia and nitrite to nitrate, but it allowed you to keep large fish uh, populations. Before that, it was all under gravel filters, which don't work that well in a marine aquarium. And of course, as we progressed to live rock, it became vogue in the hobby to use a lot of live rock. And that's great, it's fine, as long as the live rock is porous. So if you go buy Florida rock that was harvested on land, it's not porous. You need uh, a live rock that's been in the ocean and has deteriorated and microorganisms have bored into it and some of the calcium carbonate has melted out of it and it's got a lot of pores all through it. You want a piece of live rock that when you pick it up, it feels kind of like styrofoam. It doesn't have a lot of weight to it. Now, I won't do that when it's wet, but I'm talking about dry. You know, it's not as heavy as a piece of stone. Um, and when you get uh, some of the man-made products that are out there, just be careful. They're beautiful to look at, but they provide no filtration. Now, there are answers to those. We have a product called Export that has vast filtration. You can put it in a sump outside the tank. You don't have to worry about what your live rock's made out of. Some of the live rock now is even being made out of plastic. You know, so it, 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 it's beautiful to look at. It's great for the fish to swim around, but it provides no filtration. And filtration is extremely important because you have to get the waste out of the water. And corals produce waste just like fish produce waste. If you don't get it out, eventually it becomes ammonia. Ammonia is very acrid stuff. If you've ever walked into a restroom out in the, in the woods somewhere that hadn't been serviced in years and smell that smell, it'll just overwhelm you. That's what you're dealing with in the water. And of course your fish will die from it and you'll have a lot of problems. And the last one I want to mention is Kaido. Uh, Kaidomorpha is a uh, marine algae that's kind of wiry looking. And um, it's, it's found a good place now. There are a lot of Kaido filters on the market specialty lighting systems where you can grow kaido inside them. And I noticed in here we also have some algae scrubbers. Of course, algae scrubbing is a good thing to do. Basically, you're trying to take nutrients, primarily phosphorus and nitrogen compounds, out of the water. And it's a great way to do it. I will caution you on one thing. When you put nutrients into algae, it never leaves the system unless you harvest the algae. Okay, so if you get an algae scrubber that you can't get to the algae that's in there to take some of it out and throw it away, then it's not good. 
So you need to be able to take some of that chitomorpha and throw it away because then you're throwing those compounds away just like skimming the dead bacteria out, throwing those bacteria away, that makes that phosphorus leave your system. Um, so we have a new product, uh, the green one there, which is called Kaido Grow, which provides all the nutrients for Kaido to grow rapidly in your system. And you want it to grow rapidly, absorb the nutrients, and then you throw it away. And um, we put a picture of our clarifier up there. We have a polymeric clarifier that doesn't get as much play as it should, but when you're looking at this particulate matter that you're trying to get it, and some of it's too fine to remove from your aquarium, if you put a little clarifier in there just before you change your filter bags or just before you clean them, you'll take all that stuff out, and you'll, you won't imagine how much clearer your water will be. It's, it's a real help. So what are the problems that, so if we have this hypothetical tank where we're not doing much water changes and we're trying to do it with other methods, what are the problems of doing that? Well, filtration strips trace minerals. Um, I don't care what you say, whether it's carbon, whether it's protein skimming, uh, whether it's using Kaido, um, basically anything you do is gonna tra take trace minerals out of your system. And of course, then they're not available for your corals. One of the reasons Mike's talking on coral color is because just like pigment and paint, minerals provide the color for corals. If they don't have the minerals, they literally can't color up, they're not available to them. So you just need to take that into account. So the more you rev up your filtration, the more you remove trace minerals and you need to pay attention to replacing them somehow. Doing a water change with a good salt is a good way to do that. I'm gonna have to speed up here because we need to be able to get through it. But So one of the things I wanted to mention now, one of the popular testing methods so if we have, if we need to know what our mineral levels are in our aquariums, we need to be able to test to do that. So one of the popular methods of testing now is a really high-tech machine called an ICP machine. And one of the thoughts that has been proposed by some manufacturers in the hobby is that there's kind of a new segment of reef keeping called what they call coined as water uh, modern reef keeping, and that's using an ICP machine to test your water parameters and incessantly change each one. And I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, some of the representations that are being made I don't agree with. So I want to talk a little bit about misconceptions uh, for the purpose of sales. You know, when you come to something like this, even if you talk to me, I'm trying to sell products, and I'm gonna tell you something about them now. I will tell you that I try to tell you the best of my knowledge what I believe to be true. It doesn't mean I'm perfect. I don't know everything. Uh, there's plenty for me to learn. Um, but, but there is information out in the hobby that tells you something that, so we have our demonic fish up here. So this was, this was a picture that appeared in one of the major news networks recently, you might have seen it. This is, according to the headlines, a demonic fish that glows red. And there's a whole article, uh, you know, with this, with this fish, it's pretty evil looking, right? And this is an actual photograph, by the way, I think through some sort of a lens, but um, things aren't always as you perceive them to be. So this is what that fish really looks like in real life in Japan. It, it's called a Pacific Slimy Lump Sucker. So that, that's a good name too, you know. And, and they actually use them for party favors. And it's, it's, it's a fun fish, fish to watch. I would have one in my aquarium if I could, but you know, it's a temperate fish, so you need low temperature and chilling and that kind of stuff. But you know, I may do that at some point. But um, it has some, some, the peck fins have been modified in the animal to create a sucker on the bottom so it can stick to a rock. It, it, it really doesn't swim well, and they're fun to watch because they, they, they don't go in a straight line. They just kind of go all over the place. It's kind of like a misguided missile. <laughs> Here's another picture. So if this fish is as bad as the first photograph, this guy's going to lose his fingers, right? So under this auspices of modern reef keeping, basically, we don't do water changes. We just test our water. We know what's in it. We fix that. And then our tank stays stable and in good condition. And I don't agree with that philosophy because I don't, first of all, don't believe that we have good numbers where we are right now even though we have very high-tech machines. And I think sometimes you can throw the baby out with the bath water. The other problem that we have is we don't know what the organics are in our system and there's no way to measure them. So an ICP machine is an inductively coupled plasma 
um, optical emission spectroscopy machine, if I said that right. And there are a number of different manufacturers that make this machine. It's heretofore been used primarily in laboratories, in fact, fairly high uh, spec laboratories. And uh, there are at least eight different manufacturers of these machines that I've come across. And um, most of you, if you're familiar with, like in chemistry class or biology, maybe used a Bunsen burner and you put a metal in there and maybe it came a yellow flame off of it. You know, natural gas is typically blue. Um, it was that metal emitting a light spectrum. And you can read that light spectrum and then you know what metal that is. And that's the principle that this machine works on. And I'm going to have to speed up a little bit here. So this is a typical ICP machine that's pretty grainy, and I apologize for that. Um, here's another one. Uh, I did want to make a comment about this. You'll see this guy's wearing gloves and goggles because this machine is, is measuring things in micrograms per liter. And literally, you can contaminate a sample. Um, one of the companies said when they get the samples in, they divide them in two, so that means you're opening the container. Well, if you're doing that with bare hands that you ate your Big Mac with for lunch, um, you know, you can contaminate the sample and you end up with readings that don't mean anything. Um, this is a similar machine called an ICP-MS, which is a mass spectrometer. Most people have heard of those. It's a more expensive machine that's being, than the ones being used in the hobby and more accurate. And this is a graph on how an ICP machine works. And a couple things I wanted to point out to you on here was just that, so you have a sample here, you have a peristaltic pump, and you're pumping the sample into a nebulizer, which is a sprayer, kind of like your hairspray, all right? And you're pumping that into a chamber. And there are a lot of things that can happen in here that would produce inconsistent results. And with a lot of the tests that we've seen so far, we've seen a lot of inconsistency, and they claim accuracies that are astronomical, but yet we haven't seen them be able to reproduce that. And I just want you to be careful. I get a lot of phone calls from people, like I got my ICP test, and oh my God, my selenium is twice what it ought to be. And the test results that we're getting back, we're seeing numbers that are not even anywhere in the ballpark. So you're, you're taking this spray and you're using an argon gas to pressurize it and send the sample up into a torch, which heats that sample up to 10,000 degrees Kelvin. That's about twice the temperature of the surface of the sun. So we're talking about really hot, really high tech. And then you're putting that light through a prism and you're reading it with what amounts to be a camera. All right, so there's a lot of transition of things going on. There's a lot of maintenance required to run this machine. And so I just want you to be aware that um, there are things that can go wrong and you need to know who's doing your sample. One of the things not shown in the original diagram is the computer portion. And the other thing you need to know is the data coming out of this is not in micrograms per liter or milligrams per liter or any parts per million or any number that you, you would relate to. That data is all massaged in a computer with a lot of algorithms in it, and a lot of those are not linear. And you can have errors that are introduced in here. So um, the guy running the machine can make it say anything he wants it to say and print it out for you. And just, just be aware of that. So um, some of the known inaccuracies in this machine, this is an actual photograph of the front end of a machine. And what you'll notice here is here's your peristaltic pump. What that, a peristaltic pump does is it takes a piece of tubing and it squeezes it as the rollers come around. So if that tubing is in poor condition, if it's been squeezed one too many times, the volume and the pressure coming through it can vary. So there are a lot of maintenance adjustments and things that people have to pay attention to. And um, you know there, there are gaskets where this glassware is connected to the tubes. And this particular machine, you'll see this line's full of bubbles. I'm not sure what that does. So I'm not an expert on ICP, don't claim to be. I'm just saying, when I hear something that sounds like it's too good to be true and then I see the data from it and it doesn't line up, then I have pause for questions. And I just want you to be skeptical enough to ask questions to make sure the data that you're going to take and adjust, say, the nickel in your aquarium, which can be very toxic, from one thing to another, that you're not 
doing something that's detrimental to your system. So you have, you have to understand and know the, the people that you're dealing with and what their motive is. And unfortunately in this industry so far, most of the major companies that are selling IPTCP tests also sell chemicals. So they have a dollar motivation. So to me that skews anything. If a politician has dollars involved, is he voting just like he should? You know, I mean, any company has other motives than, than to necessarily give you the right numbers. This is a test, and you guys probably can't see these numbers because they're tiny. Um, this is a test that was done by a guy by the name of Dan in the UK, Dan's Reef. He sent an identical sample. He mixed up a, a, a sample of, of um, um, sea salt mix in water and sent it to the three major companies that are doing ICP tests. And he got the results back of all three. Now, all three of these claim results that are to 0.001 something, right? And um, what he found, let me look at my screen because I can't even read it from there, but um, what he found was that the, on the majors, so that's your calcium, magnesium, strontium, all your major minerals that you add, um, they were off from each other high to low by I think 11.5%. That's a lot. You know, I would expect my test kit I bought at the store to be within 10%. And we don't always see that, and we'll talk about test kits as well. Um, what is really sad is when you get to the miners, you find out that you have a lot of zeros, so you have to throw those out. If you don't, you end up with infinity, okay? So I threw out all the zeros, and the miners were off on an average of 84%. And some of these numbers are things like iron that you really need to know what's in there, because you get too much iron in the water, your corals have problems. If you don't have enough, they don't do well. So there's a lot to consider there. Um, this is an article that was written by Rich Ross. I called and talked to Rich on the phone and I asked him could I use his information in this talk today. It's called Skeptical Reef Keeping, Triton Lab ICP OES Testing of a Certified Artificial Seawater Standard. Now, Rich is a senior biologist with the Steinhardt Aquarium in San Francisco, which is a member of the California, um, um, California Academy of Sciences. And so he's not some guy you never heard of or uncredentialed. And he had a fellow by the name of Dr. Chris Malkman working with him when he did this analysis. And I'm not gonna show the results up here except in a chart. And um, there's a whole article and you should read it. It talks in depth of what an ICP machine is. You'll kind of be shocked at what's involved. There's a lot involved. And so I encourage you to, to, to get a copy of that on the internet and take a look at it. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to discuss this in our talk today was just that there were a number of statements made by one of the owners of one of the ICP testing companies at a recent convention similar to this one. And he made a lot of claims, and a lot of claims that talk about me and other people that make products in this industry, and I just wanted to address some of those things to you. He made this statement, he said, um, modern reef keeping, um, we think differently, so we measure and we replace only what needs to be replaced. Well, that sounds good, but if your tests are wrong, that's a problem. And the other problem is you're not addressing many things. So an ICP machine is not capable of measuring any gases, so oxygen, uh, nitrogen, it can't measure phosphates because it can't measure the oxygen portion, it can't measure nitrates because it can't do neither the nitrogen or the oxygen. It can't measure carbon, so no organic substances. So you're only getting a partial window into what you have in the aquarium. Sometimes a little bit of information is worse than no information. Um, he said it leads to better companies that really produce their own products. And I'm saying, well, you know, I've been making products for 30 years and I've been making them myself. And we do things that other companies don't do. And so I'm wondering about that statement. And then he said, before ICP testing, manufacturers didn't even know what was in their products. So evidently I've been making products for 30 years that I didn't know what was in them. Well, I'll tell you a little difference between me and their products, and that is we put a guaranteed analysis on our bottles. That shows you a picture of it. Uh, we tell you the specific ions that are in there. And we also put a little code down here on the side that tells you 
when it was made so we know what lot number it came from. If you call me and say, I've got a problem with my aquarium, I can look up that lot number, I can go test the sample I have, and I can say, my sample doesn't have that problem or it does have that problem, and we can investigate it further. I get a lot of calls like that from people that are having problems. For instance, uh, recently I got a call from Denver from a guy that said he made a new aquarium of our salt mix up and it sent all his family to the hospital. This was a really interesting day. And um, so I'm grappling with trying to figure out what happened with him. He said all he put in there was base rock on the bottom of the aquarium. He added our salt and water and this noxious fumes began to come off of this aquarium. His wife got sick, spent the night at the hospital, had to send his dogs to the vet. His children got sick, um, coughing and hacking. For days, he didn't call me for a couple of days after it happened. Well, come to find out, he had bought the rock off of Craigslist, and it was not base rock, it was old rock that someone had in a reef aquarium, and it had palathoa on it. Well, palathoa emits a toxin that's among the most toxic substances on the whole earth. So think of venom, very toxic stuff. And as I begin to investigate, there are a lot of people that are having problems with that. And I wanted to point it out to you because in, back in the old days, we used to tell people, you know, scrub your live rock. Don't do that anymore. Don't take a brush and scrub your live rock. You can kill yourself, okay? If you work in your aquarium, put on gloves. You know, I recommend not just the little skinny gloves that'll tear at the first sign of anything, but real gloves, particularly if you're keeping anthozoans or zoanthids of any kind. They can all exhibit palatoxins, although it's the palatho itself that's the worst. So after we investigated, what we found out was when he mixed up the seawater, what he did was he put the rock in the aquarium, then he put salt from the bag right on top of the rock. Then he added water, so he had this concentrated salt, which our salt heats up because it's anhydrous, so it's gonna get hot when you first make it. And so he heated this stuff up, basically, and released fumes from it in the, in the air. So before you do something like that, think, mix your salt water in a bucket, you know, put it in the aquarium like we tell you on the bag, and pay attention uh, to the rock that you have in the system. So these are the test results that they did in uh, the head in the skeptical reef keeping. And I don't know if you can read that or not. It's a little bit more readable than the other one. Um, what you'll notice here, this is where they had a, a government um, certified standards testing laboratory. They make standards for the EPA. They make standards for NASA. They make standards for government organizations and universities and things like that. So these people really know what they're doing. And so they mixed up a, a standard of seawater and this is a list of what was in that water, and here's a list of results of what this particular lab, uh, aquarium testing company came up with, and here are the differences. And what you'll notice in off minus 100%, off up 500% too high, off 100% on iron, off 32% on copper, I mean, that's terrible. So these are worse numbers than you find on a test kit. So just because someone has a machine that's really expensive and really high tech, doesn't mean that they're providing you with data that's right. And you can do something based on wrong data. This is one of the th reasons that I subscribe to understanding what your corals should look like. You know, it's just like your child or your dog, you know when they're sick, you know, you, you, you understand what they're supposed to look like when they're healthy. So you pay attention to your corals when they're healthy and then when they get sick, then you know that. So not every test that you get is correct. Now, one of the things that we did, um, we have Steve here, I think, yeah, Steve Visser is here. Steve owns a company, and uh, I'm gonna give him a little shameless plug here, um, called icpanalysis.com, and one of the things I like about Steve is Steve doesn't make chemicals, so he's not got something to sell you besides a test, and he puts a lot into his testing, and the other advantage that Steve has that all three of those people that we put up there a while ago are European testing companies. One's in Poland, one's in Germany, one's in England. So by the time you send your sample from here, well, let me just back up for a second. So the IPCP, uh, um, the standards laboratory tells you that you need to have a sample that's less than 12 hours old or they don't want to test it, okay? You're not going to do that to Poland, okay? It's going to take longer than that, sometimes a week or two. Um, before they actually get the test. So you have precipitation going on. When you put something on a jet plane, you have temperature changes, pressure changes that cause reactions to occur in the water. These are things that happen in your tank. We talked about alkalinity being temporary hardness. Those things happen in your aquarium anyway. So, um, you know, take a look at Steve, talk to him. He's in a booth. What's your name of your booth, Steve? Uh, 
Coral View booth. It's kind of in the big middle of the show on the second aisle as you come in and talk to them about ICP testing. I think that my opinion so far with ICP is that it's probably the future. Um, once we get it right, it'll be a real help to us. I don't think it ever should eliminate water changes. Um, I think we need more information about what trace minerals that we have. I think when Mike talks, she's gonna to talk to you about some of those minerals and how they affect your corals. And, um, but so far, what we've done is we've taken a machine that's extremely expensive. We won way too many through tests through it. And our samples are not sufficient in size. Um, that uh, nebulizer can get salt creep. You know what salt creep is? You get on your tank all over the place. You know, if you're not careful, you can mix sample A with sample B. So you got a test, maybe it was accurate, but it's a test of half of your water and, the, and the half of the next guy's water. So some of those things I'm convinced are occurring and that's why we're getting these numbers that are off and they can't agree with each other. And we don't know what the issues are necessarily that are making the system not work. I'm just telling you the system isn't working yet. You know, maybe it'll be soup at some point, but today it's not. And um, so just be careful when you have those tests run. I get the calls from guys that, you know, they're really upset. They think they mixed up a new batch of our salt and some number is off a little bit or whatever. And what I tell them all the time is, listen, you know, we make our salt from bag chemicals. We buy USP grade, we buy ACS reagent grade chemicals. We buy chemicals by assay where they've been to a laboratory and tested. We've always known what were in our products. You know, so these people don't know what, what they're talking about. I mean, I wouldn't have sold you anything ever that I didn't know was in it. I mean, how could you do that? Um, so, um, you know, when you see a test result from one of those companies that's way off, stop and think, you know, is this an aberration? Is this something that's not right? Um, you know, it, it, the chances are that what's in my salt is correct because we measure it. It's like you doing a cake mix in the, you know, you so many cups of this and so many cups of that, we're measuring things out on a gram scale and sometimes things that are much less than a gram. So what about hobby test kit accuracy? Um, so what about hobby test kits? Quickly, this is an article I found, Aquarium Chemistry, an attempt to test test kits by James Fothery and Dr. David Flanagan. It's a great article to read. It's a little old, it's 2012. Um, it only tests pH, nitrate, um, alkalinity, and a calcium test kit. So most of these you wouldn't see on an ICP because they can't test those quantities, but it can test calcium. And, um, you know, the test results weren't that great in here. One of the problems I have with the, with the article is a lot of the test kits that they test were out of date. So this is a big thing you should pay attention to. If you go buy a test kit from a pet store, it could have been sitting there three or four years and the reagents are old. So, you know, that's something you should pay attention to. In fact, you buy one of my chemicals, you ought to turn it around. We have a number that says EXP with a number behind it. Well, that number behind it is the date it's gonna expire, okay? And um, the US government has unfortunately now said that we should put the date of manufacture on these things, which I think is very misleading. I'm still putting an expiration date because I think that's what you're really after is when is this good until, you know, is the question you're asking because you don't know how long it's good after the day it's made if I just put the day it's made because our bacteria, for instance, is only good for two years. You know, where a bottle of calcium is probably good for 10 years, we, I think we mark them four or five years. You know, it, it, basically the bottle integrity has got to break down. So my whole point is if you can't accurately measure what's in the water, then certainly a water change is e makes even more sense. And one of the things I think that you ought to do is take a look at the people that raise the corals that you buy from, like the company that puts on Reef of Palooza Worldwide Corals. Ben is here from Eye Catching Corals in the back. Uh, these people have been doing this for a long time and they understand what these animals need. Talk to them, what salt do you use? You know, what, uh, what chemicals do you use? How do you um, keep your corals in good condition? And you know they'll give you a lot of really good information straight from the horse's mouth because if they don't do it, they basically go out of business and go under. You know, so they can't afford to kill all their corals because it's not a hobby to them anymore. I think I'm going to stop right there. Um, this is the CDC report that we talked about on palatoxins. Is something you ought to pay attention to, and we can discuss this during the question and answer period if you'd like. 
Quickly, there's just several different kinds of salt mixes. You have fish only salt mixes, you have reef salt mixes, you have salt mixes made from bad chemicals. You have, most of them are hydrated, which means they have water in the salt. So that's why you'll buy a, a, a sack of one particular brand and it takes 16 pounds to make 50 gallons of seawater. You buy mine, it's a little over 14 pounds because mine is anhydrous, which means without water. So my salt is literally dry. It will chafe your fingers. If you put your hands in my salt, it's gonna chafe your skin because it'll suck the moisture right out. But it's a higher purity salt, and that's what you have to do to get that. They don't make uh, hydrated chemicals in the purities that we buy. So that's why we do it. And then you have the last kind, which I can't stand, and that's salt made from old seawater from a desalinization plant. Basically, they're taking waste that's sprayed out on the desert they're scooping that stuff up with a front end loader with sand, bird feathers, and guano, and whatever else is in it, mixing it up and selling it to you, and you need to investigate. I'm not gonna tell you who it is, but there are companies that live off of making salt that way, and I don't care how pretty their bucket is, what they're putting in, it's garbage. You know, it, it literally is waste. And so I don't know how you, even with US law, put waste in a bucket and sell it as a brand new product. You can't do that with a pillow. You can't do it with a mattress, they'll haul you off. You know, you see all the tags on your mattresses and everything, that's because people used to sell old stuffing in a mattress. So I recommend you don't do that, that you buy from a reputable company. Um, quickly on, on water changes, um, first of all, cheap salt's not a bargain. I got a guy call me recently, he wanted to buy a cheap brand of salt, he wanted to know how much calcium to add, how much strontium, and he had a small aquarium, like 30 gallons. I said, why don't you buy our salt and you don't have to add any of that stuff, you know, to sweeten it up, it's already there. So these are, things that you should talk about. I mean, my salt for say a um, 150 gallon bucket's probably $10 more than one of the lesser salts, but you know, you're gonna get full seawater level of calcium and magnesium and good alkalinity level, and you're gonna have high quality chemicals in there and you're gonna get good results with it. So I think it's a decision that everybody has to make. I do think that, um, you know, putting, putting junk in an aquarium makes no sense. It's kind of like, you got a new Mercedes Benz and you decide to buy recycled motor oil, you know, you save $10 in oil change. Well, when you pay for that $10,000 engine, it's not so nice, you know. So, um, do you want to do a 30% water change or do you want a 10% water change? And I think the question there is, what are you doing the water change for? So, if you're wanting to keep the parameters stable in the aquarium, because you don't like adding trace minerals and supplements to the tank, then I think you need to do a 10% once a week. I think if you're trying to take the organics out of the water and keep a clean aquarium, but then you're supplementing calcium and other things by test, then I think you do a 25 or 30% change once a month is my favorite. So um, that's, that's what I believe about that. And um, don't change your brand of salt very often. You know, don't buy, it's not like coffee, don't buy the cheapest thing they got and the you know, thing that's most convenient. Get a brand of salt, stick with it, even if it's not mine, you'll do better, your animals will acclimate. So there again, you know, keep things as stable as you can. These animals come from the ocean where things are quite stable and they don't do well with the changes, um, changing of the wind. So that's all for my talk today. I appreciate your time and, and coming and then, thank you very much.